The Desire of Ages Chapter 25 The Call by the Sea This chapter is based on Matthew 4, Mark 1, and Luke 5. Day was breaking over the Sea of Galilee. The disciples, weary with a night of fruitless toil, were still in their fishing boats on the lake. Jesus had come to spend a quiet hour by the waterside. In the early morning, he hoped for a little season of rest from the multitude that followed him day after day. But soon the people began to gather about him. Their numbers rapidly increased, so that he was pressed upon all sides. Meanwhile, the disciples had come to land. In order to escape the pressure of the multitude, Jesus stepped into Peter's boat and bade him pull out a little from the shore. Here, Jesus could be better seen and heard by all, and from the boat he taught the multitude on the beach. What a scene was this for angels to contemplate. Their glorious commander, sitting in a fisherman's boat, swayed to and fro by the restless waves, and proclaiming the good news of salvation to the listening throng that were pressing down to the water's edge. He who was the honored of heaven was declaring the great things of his kingdom in the open air to the common people. Yet he could have had no more fitting scene for his labors. The lake, the mountains, the spreading fields, the sunlight flooding the earth, all furnished objects to illustrate his lessons and impress them upon the mind. And no lesson of Christ's fell fruitless. Every message from his lips came to some soul as the word of eternal life. Every moment added to the multitude upon the shore, aged men leaning upon their staffs, hardy peasants from the hills, fishermen from their toil on the lake, merchants and rabbis, the rich and the learned, old and young, bringing their sick and suffering ones, pressed to hear the words of the divine teacher. To such scenes as this, the prophets had looked forward, and they wrote, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, toward the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw a great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, to them did light spring up. Beside the throng on the shores of Genezareth, Jesus in his sermon by the sea had other audiences before his mind. Looking down the ages, he saw his faithful ones in prison and judgment hall, in temptation and loneliness and affliction. Every scene of joy and conflict and perplexity was open before him. In the words spoken to those gathered about him, he was speaking also to these other souls the very words that would come to them as a message of hope in trial, of comfort in sorrow, and heavenly light in darkness. Through the Holy Spirit, that voice which is speaking from the fisherman's boat on the Sea of Galilee would be heard speaking peace to human hearts to the close of time. The discourse ended. Jesus turned to Peter and bade him launch out into the sea and let down his net for a draught. But Peter was disheartened. All night he had taken nothing. During the lonely hours, he had thought of the fate of John the Baptist, who was languishing alone in his dungeon. He had thought of the prospect before Jesus and his followers, of the ill success of the mission to Judea, and the malice of the priests and rabbis. Even his own occupation had failed him, and as he watched by the empty nets, the future had seemed dark with discouragement. Master, he said, we have toiled all the night, and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. Night was the only favorable time for fishing with nets in the clear waters of the lake. After toiling all night without success, 
it seemed hopeless to cast the net by day. But Jesus had given the command, and love for their master moved the disciples to obey. Simon and his brother together let down the net. As they attempted to draw it in, so great was the quantity of fish enclosed that it began to break. They were obliged to summon James and John to their aid. When the catch was secured, both the boats were so heavily laden that they were in danger of sinking. But Peter was unmindful now of boats or lading. This miracle, above any other he had ever witnessed, was to him a manifestation of divine power. In Jesus, he saw one who held all nature under his control. The presence of divinity revealed his own unholiness. Love for his master, shame for his own unbelief, gratitude for the condescension of Christ, above all, the sense of his uncleanness in the presence of infinite purity overwhelmed him. While his companions were securing the contents of the net, Peter fell at the Saviour's feet, exclaiming, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. It was the same presence of divine holiness that had caused the prophet Daniel to fall as one dead before the angel of God. He said, My comeliness was turned in me into corruption, and I retained no strength. So when Isaiah beheld the glory of the Lord, he exclaimed, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Daniel 10 and verse 8, Isaiah 6 and verse 5. Humanity, with its weakness and sin, was brought in contrast with the perfection of divinity, and he felt altogether deficient and unholy. Thus it has been with all who have been granted a view of God's greatness and majesty. Peter exclaimed, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. Yet he clung to the feet of Jesus, feeling that he could not be parted from him. The Savior answered, Fear not. From henceforth thou shalt catch men. It was after Isaiah had beheld the holiness of God and his own unworthiness that he was entrusted with the divine message. It was after Peter had been led to self-renunciation and dependence upon divine power that he received the call to his work for Christ. Until this time, none of the disciples had fully united as co-laborers with Jesus. They had witnessed many of his miracles and had listened to his teaching, but they had not entirely forsaken their former employment. The imprisonment of John the Baptist had been to them all a bitter disappointment. If such were to be the outcome of John's mission, they could have little hope for their master with all the religious leaders combined against him. Under the circumstances, it was a relief to them to return for a short time to their fishing. But now, Jesus called them to forsake their former life and unite their interests with his. Peter had accepted the call. Upon reaching the shore, Jesus bade the three other disciples, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately, they left all and followed him. Before asking them to leave their nets and fishing boats, Jesus had given them the assurance that God would supply their needs. The use of Peter's boat for the work of the gospel had been richly repaid. He who is rich unto all that call upon him has said, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over. Romans 10 verse 12, Luke 6 verse 38. In this measure, he had rewarded the disciples' service. 
and every sacrifice that is made in his ministry will be recompensed according to the exceeding riches of his grace. Ephesians 3 verse 20 and Ephesians 2 verse 7 During that sad night on the lake, when they were separated from Christ, the disciples were pressed hard by unbelief and weary with fruitless toil. But his presence kindled their faith and brought them joy and success. So it is with us. Apart from Christ, our work is fruitless, and it is easy to distrust and murmur. But when he is near, and when we labor under his direction, we rejoice in the evidence of his power. It is Satan's work to discourage the soul. It is Christ's work to inspire with faith and hope. The deeper lesson which the miracle conveyed for the disciples is a lesson for us also. That he whose word could gather the fishes from the sea could also impress human hearts and draw them by the cords of his love, so that his servants might become fishers of men. They were humble and unlearned men, those fishers of Galilee, but Christ, the light of the world, was abundantly able to qualify them for the position for which he had chosen them. The Savior did not despise education, for when controlled by the love of God and devoted to his service, intellectual culture is a blessing. But he passed by the wise men of his time because they were so self-confident that they could not sympathize with suffering humanity and become co-laborers with the man of Nazareth. In their bigotry, they scorned to be taught by Christ. The Lord Jesus seeks the cooperation of those who will become unobstructed channels for the communication of his grace. The first thing to be learned by all who would become workers together with God is the lesson of self-distrust. Then they are prepared to have imparted to them the character of Christ. This is not to be gained through education in the most scientific schools. It is the fruit of wisdom that is obtained from the divine teacher alone. Jesus chose unlearned fishermen because they had not been schooled in the traditions and erroneous customs of their time. They were men of native ability and they were humble and teachable, men whom he could educate for his work. In the common walks of life, there is many a man patiently treading the round of daily toil, unconscious that he possesses powers which, if called into action, could raise him to an equality with the world's most honored men. The touch of a skillful hand is needed to arouse those dormant faculties. It was such men that Jesus called to be his co-laborers, and he gave them the advantage of association with himself. Never had the world's great men such a teacher. When the disciples came forth from the Savior's training, they were no longer ignorant and uncultured. They had become like him in mind and character, and men took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. It is not the highest work of education to communicate knowledge merely, but to impart that vitalizing energy which is received through the contact of mind with mind and soul with soul. It is only life that can beget life. What privilege then was theirs who for three years were in daily contact with that divine life from which has flowed every life-giving impulse that has blessed the world. Above all his companions, John, the beloved disciple, yielded himself to the power of that wondrous life. He says, The life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father 
and was manifested unto us. Of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. 1 John 1 verse 2 and John 1 verse 16. In the apostles of our Lord, there was nothing to bring glory to themselves. It was evident that the success of their labors was due only to God. The lives of these men, the characters they developed, and the mighty work that God wrought through them are a testimony to what he will do for all who are teachable and obedient. He who loves Christ the most will do the greatest amount of good. There is no limit to the usefulness of one who by putting self aside makes room for the working of the Holy Spirit upon his heart and lives a life wholly consecrated to God. If men will endure the necessary discipline without complaining or fainting by the way, God will teach them hour by hour and day by day. He longs to reveal His grace. If His people will remove the obstructions, He will pour forth the waters of salvation in abundant streams through the human channels. If men in humble life were encouraged to do all the good they could do, if restraining hands were not laid upon them to repress their zeal, there would be a hundred workers for Christ, where now there is one. God takes men as they are and educates them for his service if they will yield themselves to him. The Spirit of God received into the soul will quicken all its faculties. Under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, the mind that is devoted unreservedly to God develops harmoniously and is strengthened to comprehend and fulfill the requirements of God. The weak, vacillating character becomes changed to one of strength and steadfastness. Continual devotion establishes so close a relation between Jesus and his disciples that the Christian becomes like him in mind and character. Through a connection with Christ, he will have clearer and broader views. His discernment will be more penetrative his judgment better balanced. He who longs to be of service to Christ is so quickened by the life-giving power of the Son of Righteousness that he is enabled to bear much fruit to the glory of God. Men of the highest education in the arts and sciences have learned precious lessons from Christians in humble life who were designated by the world as unlearned. But these obscure disciples had obtained an education in the highest of all schools. They had sat at the feet of him who spoke as never man spake. The End of Chapter 25 Of the Desire of Ages